Well, we're done. Happy now? Ready to hug Stephen Moffat? So you can hide your face? Episode 12, Death in Heaven, Part 2 of the Series 8 finale, written by Stephen Moffat, the showrunner, directed by Rachel Talale. They were both on board for last week's Part 1, Dark Water. This episode shows all of Moffat's strengths and maybe a few of his weaknesses, but the strengths prevail by far. Previously, as Dark Water faded out, the Cybermen are invading London. Dead Danny Pink is faced with the option of deleting his emotions, and the boy he killed in warfare lingers nearby. Clara, trapped in a room with a Cyberman, and the Doctor, staggered to realize that his long-time nemesis, the Master, has returned as evil Mary Poppins. And to quote the Internet, you won't believe what happens next. Spoilers. Well, I didn't believe it. They went and gave Jenna Coleman top billing, even used her eyes in the credits. No companion has ever been so honored. I think she earned it. And I think at least one other might have earned it as well, but they weren't using eyes in the reboot before the Clara era. Eyes are cool. First of a long list of really cool things that Moffat and crew stuffed into the episode, including Osgood's bow tie. Bow ties are still a little dorky. Side gags and jokes, twists and shockers, answers to lingering questions, payoffs, and resolutions to issues that Moffat has been nurturing throughout the season, and a bit of contrived fan service. Favorite side gags? Londoners taking Cyberman selfies, the Dome of St. Paul's opening like a flower, flying Cybermen with rocket shoes, fan service, the Doctor saluting an old comrade. Shockers, a brutal killing of a fan-favorite character, an unexpected kiss, an unexpected hug, an unexpected Marilyn Monroe impersonation, and glorious performances from the entire cast, especially Samuel Anderson as Danny Pink, Jenna Coleman as Clara, most especially Peter Capaldi and Michelle Gomez as the Doctor and the Master. What a delicious actor's duel. I presume, or at least hope, that before evaporating her in a blast from a cyber brig, Moffat had worked out how to bring her back. In fact, he said as much in an interview, said there's nothing to work out. He would be guided by the way Anthony Ainley's master returned after being killed off time and again, said Moffat. He would turn up at the start of the next master story with roughly this explanation. I escaped. Suits me, I'm fine with that, said Moffat, and I'm fine with it too, says Mikola. More Missy, please. As with any good Doctor Who, this episode hit many notes. Comedy, thrills, arrogance, terror, but the notes that lingered longest, especially at the end, were sadness, longing, and loss. It's what makes the finale stick in your memory. But before I get to the meat of tonight's thrilling conclusion, since it is a culmination, I want to back up for a giant dose of previously. I binge-watched all of Series 8. All of it. And for good measure, I went back to Series 7 and watched a lot of that, too. In my fantasy world, Ang Lee, director of Life of Pi, Crouching Tiger, and many other great films, is watching this review, and he needs the summary. This is for Ang Lee. For the rest of you, here's your handy skip the previously button. See you on the other side. Where are my notes? Where are my notes? My notes. Aha, my notes. Good. Previously. Let's talk about Clara. Let's rewind to review Clara's story. We first glimpsed her more than two years ago, but at the time we knew her not as Clara, but as Oswin. For his part, the doctor, Eleven, Matt Smith, only heard her voice because her visible form was a Dalek. She had been converted into a Dalek, a virtual souffle-making Dalek. Oswin sacrificed herself as the doctor flew off with Rory and Amy. Some symmetry there, don't you think? Clara, or at least this version of her, ends her life as a Dalek, and her boyfriend Danny ends his life as a Cyberman. Oh, they would have made a cute couple, don't you think? In that episode, the Doctor never actually saw Oswin except as a Dalek. We, of course, saw Jenna Louise Coleman, and we scratched our heads when Oswin died because we thought we were looking at the new companion, but, but, but she died. What? Fast forward to the Christmas special, and the puzzle deepens. Depressed by the departure of Rory and Amy, the Doctor is retired to Victorian London where he encounters someone who looks just like the girl from the Dalek, to us anyway. But this Clara also dies in that episode. Again, what? The doctor retreats further into the past, to a medieval monastery. Suddenly the TARDIS phone rings, and it's Clara, alive again. What, what, what? She's looking for tech support. How'd she get the number of the TARDIS? From a woman in a shop. Cue fan speculation. Who was that woman? Well, tonight we had the answer. Although, from the moment Missy first appeared, many assumed she must have been the woman in the shop. And you, if you were one of them, are probably gloating right now. Online, you can find a prequel that Moffat wrote to Episode 6. The Doctor is hanging out in a playground, sitting on the swings, and chatting up young Clara. Bit of a stalker, that Doctor. I wonder what would happen if I went to the local park and waited on the swings to chat up young girls. In Episode 6, Clara dies again. And her mind is uploaded to a computer system hidden in a London landmark. Hmm. Upload people's minds to computer in a London landmark. <laughs> Make a note of that, Moffat. You may want to use it again someday. More symmetry with the boyfriend. 
Clara uploaded to the Shard. Danny to St. Paul's. Moffat loves symmetry, don't he? Or is he just out of ideas? Well, there's an upside for Clara in the experience. It leaves her with excellent hacking skills. In Episode 7, we learn of Clara's parents, her birth, her childhood. We learn of it in a rather creepy way. The Doctor uses his time machine to stalk her parents as they meet. He's there for her birth. He watches her play in the park. He's there for her mom's funeral. There is no stalker like a stalker with a time machine. For all this really creepy stalking, he's no closer to solving the mystery. In Episode 9, he takes grown-up Clara to visit a psychic who pronounces, She's just a normal person. There's nothing, nothing special. But one other thing of note in that Episode 9... Clara persuades the TARDIS to let her in just by talking to its voice visual interface. Imagine that! Unlocking the TARDIS without keys! Keys? We ain't got no keys! We don't need no keys! I don't have to show you any stinking keys! Episode 11, the children whom Clara takes care of discover photos from her time-traveling adventures on the internet. They also discover a picture of that other Clara, the one who died in the Christmas special. One that our Clara has no memory of. Now, our Clara herself is beginning to wonder what's up. In the name of the Doctor, the mystery is solved. The mystery of the impossible girl deepens first, though. It turns out there are even more Claras than we knew about. Through very clever editing and compositing, we see a montage that shows versions of Clara aiding the Doctor in every one of his incarnations. Hello, retcon! But later in the episode, the mystery is indeed solved with a bit of the old timey-wimey. To save the Doctor, Clara sacrifices herself again, walking into his very dangerous time stream, and that acts as some kind of a Xerox cloning machine, fragmenting her and scattering her copies through the Doctor's timeline. Now it's the Doctor's turn to save Clara by following her into the same very dangerous time stream, and ta-da! Everything is good. In the 50th anniversary, Clara saves Gallifrey, and the Doctor's soul, as well as Earth. The Doctor seems to be given a charge to find Gallifrey, and finally, in the Christmas special, Gallifrey reveals itself to be just on the other side of a crack in the universe. Series 7 Clara is feisty, charming, cute, and yet she draws a lot of criticism as being a generic, perky, smart, loyal, attractive female. She seems totally, unquestioningly devoted to the Doctor, to serving his interests. Enter number 12, Peter Capaldi. Exit Louise. Between Series 7 and 8, the actor changed her billing from Jenna Louise Coleman to simply Jenna Coleman. But more important, the character starts to feel more grounded and independent. Series 8, Clara evolves. Moffat gives her an outside love interest, an ex-soldier called Danny Pink. I always thought that Russell T. Davis's companions gained a lot by having families who didn't travel with them, usually meddling families. And giving Clara a life outside the TARDIS was an important addition. Clara is now in a three-way stretch between her job as a teacher, her budding romantic relationship, and her moonlighting as a Time Lord companion. Meanwhile... Throughout Series 8, Clara is learning more and more about the Doctor's ways, the lies, the bluffs, the bravado. She is, as we saw in Flatline, able to become the Doctor. Brain crack? There might be a market for a business book entitled Leadership Secrets of Doctor Who as told to Clara Oswald. wonder if someone's working on that. Bet you could sell a few copies. Are you still with me, Ang Lee? Danny. Let's talk about Danny, former soldier, current maths teacher at the Coal Hill School. Gentle and patient, troubled and quiet the third and least dynamic corner of an awkward triangle, madly in love with Clara, wary and suspicious of the Doctor. The Doctor apparently holds Danny in contempt for having been a soldier. Danny, in turn, resents the Doctor for having the arrogance of an officer. Such pals. Of course, each resents the other for their claim on Clara's time and attention. She tells Danny that she has stopped traveling in the TARDIS, and she hasn't. Danny, in episode 10, discovers that. Not happy is Danny. He gives her a homework assignment. Come clean and make your choice. The post-it notes we saw at the beginning of the last episode represent Clara working out her homework, and it is just at the moment that Clara is turning in her assignment to tell Danny what she really feels that Danny is killed. One other puzzle about Danny. In, in one of the strongest episodes of the season, we meet a descendant of his. Now, who's that? What's up with that? Now that Danny is dead, by a previous girlfriend? Or is Clara pregnant? Or is that timeline erased? Backtrack. The Doctor in the 50th anniversary episode, Matt Smith, 11, asks Tom Baker 4 whether he's supposed to now go and find Gallifrey. Then he marches out to take his place among all his predecessors and announces he now is no longer a wanderer, but he has a destination, to go home. But in Series 8, the quest to find Gallifrey, back burner. In fact, in Episode 10, the Doctor pronounces himself the last of the Time Lords. Has he forgotten that Gallifrey falls no more? The Doctor has spent much of the series just reflecting on his own identity and purpose. Am I a good man? You are a good Dalek. The Master, originally played by Roger Delgado in the time of the third Doctor, last glimpse as played by John Sim in David Tennant's finale. He was being hustled off with the rest of the Time Lords into a time lock. 
whatever that is. Hovering as a mysterious shadow over all of Series 8, actually appearing in these episodes, is Missy, whom we now know is the Master. And that's what you missed on Glee. <laughs> Hello again. Having set up the board with all these pieces, Moffat begins part two, keeping them all in play, giving all his characters wonderful moments, dread choices, and searing confrontations. Not That Hunter posted a comment on my previous review calling attention to three themes we've seen throughout the series, and he wondered whether we're going to be seeing them again in the finale. Let me review them with you. Robots, cyborgs, and androids looking for redemption or for their souls. Even the robots of Sherwood are heading to paradise. The Virtues of Soldiers, which seem very hard for the Doctor to comprehend. Danny's story. The Mummy. And overall, the question of the Doctor's nature. Am I a good man? Answered by the Dalek, you are a good Dalek. When looking at the finale, let's see what Stephen Moffat did to resolve those three themes. Fizzy Lyman suggests Moffat might have done even more than he did to set up the overarching themes throughout the course of the series. I'll include a link to his video in my playlists. I don't agree with everything he said, but I think he's got a good point. Missy, the master. Yes, Moffat went there, having Missy kill off a fan favorite who in many ways embodies fandom. Osgood in a bow tie is cool. Osgood disintegrated. Not so cool. Horrible. Giant oh no's echoing through the Hooniverse. But Missy is evil. You can't just say it. You have to show it. She had to do something evil. Still, I couldn't help think about the contempt Moffat showed to Sherlock's fans in The Empty Hearse, the way Woody Allen depicted his fans in Stardust Memories. The quiet hero of the episode, of course, is Danny Pink, who manages to retain his humanity even after being downloaded back into his body and encased in a Cyberman exoskeleton. Danny, I take back everything I said about you last time about how boring you were. You moved me. That was good work. Well staged, too. Clara hugging the exoskeleton. Stiff Danny looking down at her. On the theme of robots and cyborgs finding or keeping their souls, Danny says yes, it's possible. He says it by refusing to harm Clara and by his final sacrifice to return the boy he killed. The Doctor is offered command of all the armies of Earth by his allies. He's offered command of all the armies of the dead by his enemy. He turns them both down. And yet, the biggest surprise to me, after Clara's eyes and the title was the return of that one soldier the Doctor is happy to salute, the Brig. Brigadier Sir Alistair Gordon Lethbridge Stewart, head of unit, dead, but back in a painting aboard Boat One, and later back as a Cyberman. He is father and apparently catcher of Kate Stewart, the current chief science officer of unit, who was thrown out of an airplane. Talk about your deus ex machina. If I weren't in a complete puddle by then, I would have objected that was just one step too far in unlikely contrivances, but by then I had completely suspended all my disbelief. Willingly. I'm not going to poke holes. I, I just surrendered. I do have to ask, though, what's with the lying? Clara lies to Danny, to the Cybermen, to the Doctor. Lying to the Cybermen's okay, I get that. It's, it's for survival, but the rest? The Doctor lies to Clara, goes without saying that Missy lies. Fittingly, it's Missy's final lie that's the cruelest one of all. The one lie that makes Capaldi's Doctor come completely unhinged. It was a strong choice on Moffat's part to write that final scene where the Doctor and Clara deceive each other out of mutual regard. If I wanted to poke at things, and I don't, but if I wanted to get critical, I would say that the big issue of the series, Am I a Good Man?, was just a straw man. It was only set up so he could knock it down with a line about being an idiot with a box and a screwdriver. Is the Doctor a good man? Come on, he's been a hero for 50 years. Why question it in the 51st? We all knew the answer, didn't we? But I'm not feeling critical. I won't bring it up. I am very happy for a good season. Certainly a better season than those convoluted stories we've been having for the past few years. And we had a grand ending. I grade on a curve now. Until next time, I'm Mikola. <laughs> DVD extras. I, I didn't want to go here, but I'm going to have to say it. How weird is it that Stephen Moffat managed to take all the menace out of the Cybermen? I mean, when they were making Cybermen out of living people, that was scary. Dead people? I don't know. Who cares? Living people, the Cybermen were like religious fanatics trying to convert you to their faith, trying to save you, upgrade you, make you a better person. This crowd, they, they have no interest in us, in the living. In fact, the only purpose for these Cybermen was to be props for Missy. She just wanted to use them to taunt the doctor. Sorry, didn't want to go there because I really liked the show, but sometimes I just... Can't help myself. Thank you for watching these. I'm very happy to put the Doctor Who reviews into a time lock for a while. Yeah, these are my previous reviews. And there's a playlist of other reviews of Death in Heaven, The Usual Suspects, Barry Aldridge, Darren Locke, Emergency Awesome, and a new entry, 
some thoughts from Fizzy Lyman about how this series might have been even better than it was. Bye now!